Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, January 9th. 2023. On this episode, I'm going to explain a little bit about the Federalist versus Anti-Federalist debate over consolidation or heavy centralization of power. Now, everyone pretty much, at least publicly, agreed that it was a bad thing. The debate was really more over semantics, whether this uh, the proposed government under the Constitution was going to be qualified as consolidated, properly defined or not. But uh, that was primarily on the Federalist side. They were basically saying, no, this definitely does not qualify as consolidated. There are some consolidating features and it's more powerful than what we had before, but it isn't technically consolidated, so it isn't a despotism. And the anti-Federalists, some of them said absolutely it already is, but others actually warned, well, that's how it's going to play out in practice. And a little TLDW, My position on this is, well, today we live under the largest government in the history of the planet. And if that doesn't fit the definition of a centralized, consolidated government, I don't think one ever did or ever will. But I think this will be a lot of interesting info for you. Before getting to that, a quick hello and a huge thank you. Thank you so much for being here, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. While we allow people another minute or so to get notifications to join us, Uh, on the live stream, get uh, notifications from places like YouTube and Facebook and elsewhere. I want to say hello to everyone out in the live chat. There's Liberty Revolutionary, Cheriton Farmer, Haji in Michigan, Larry Clark, Dixie Strong in Bama, Joshua Bennett, Clay Kent, M. Gabriel, Mary Catherine Cowboy, Bill Despain, who asks about Patrick Henry. I've got a lot of Patrick Henry on this one as well. But I should mention that I've got a lot of uh, other episodes and original source documents. That So if you want to follow along with the stuff that I'm talking about in this episode, because I'm just scratching the surface, you definitely want to follow us over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. There I publish a blog post about one to two hours after the live stream is done, sometimes sooner. But that gives me a little leeway in case I have other things that have to be done on a deadline. But I generally publish a blog post about one to two hours after the live stream is done. And on each blog post, you'll not only find all the different platforms we're on. We have a bunch of uh, mainstream video live streaming platforms. We also archive all over the place, Minds and Gab, etc. We also have the audio-only podcast edition. But I also have a show link section where you can say, hey, dude, you mentioned such and such a reference link or a speech or an episode. Where do I find that? Just go to 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty and find the episode there. Let's start out with a few of the views on consolidation across the political spectrum. People who are kind of, uh, you know, basically straddling the fence between Federalists and Anti-Federalists, some who are pure Federalists, some who are pure Anti-Federalists. I want to start out with Samuel Adams here, who said, The people of the United States under one consolidated government cannot long remain free or indeed under any kind of government but despotism. So the more power that the one government has to rule over everybody, to make decisions over anything and everything, the more that, well, you're going to have what Samuel Adams warned, would be despotism. Here's George Washington from his farewell address. He talks about the spirit of encroachment, this spirit, uh, this idea that you can just go a little further encroach on the powers of another department or powers reserved to the people of the several states. He says, doing this, this tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments into one and thus to create whatever the form of government, a real despotism. So going beyond the limits of power, will over time create a real despotism, according to George Washington. Here's John Lansing Jr., a consolidated government, could not preserve the essential liberty rights and liberties of the people. You're not going to be free with a centralized power. Fisher Ames, who was a rabid Federalist, said too much provision cannot be made against a consolidation. He just didn't think it was a consolidated government, but if it was, you can't do too much to stop that. And here's Patrick Henry, Virginia ratifying convention. He said, dangers are to be apprehended in whatever manner we proceed, but those of a consolidation are the most destructive to Patrick Henry and to many others. The more centralized a state, the more guaranteed you would be that you would have no liberty 
in the long run. Again, there was very little debate or discussion over the fact that consolidation would always be dangerous to liberty. Now, there's a few who probably absolutely loved it, but most everybody, again, at least publicly, accepted this as a political maxim. I think the anti-federalist writer Brutus is one of the few that actually explained why consolidation was bad. And I did an episode covering this, his first paper. I did a, a whole series on all the Brutus anti-federalist papers, Cato, and I'm wrapping up soon Patrick Henry's anti-federalist speeches. You can find all those over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. But I will link to the episode on Brutus paper number one, which I did a couple of years ago, and some of the highlights of what he said would play out under a centralized consolidated state uh, though the will of the power, the the will of the people in power is what becomes law, rather than having a supreme law of the land. It's just the people who have power. The more centralized, consolidated the state, the more that law really just is up to those who can wield enough power to make it however they want it to be. Hmm, that was a pretty good prediction. He said we'd have factions, basically one side fighting over the other for the control of everything. And Washington, of course, warned against the danger of factions as well. He said we'd have standing armies. And in essence, we'd have a government of force. And that's where the anti-federalist writer Cato took things in his third paper. He basically said that a consolidated government could never be based on freedom and consent. Instead, you'd have to use violence, the threat of violence and force to get your way, because in a large landmass, in a large republic, you can't have everyone have the exact same views. That's why you're supposed to only have a very general government with limited delegated purposes clearly defined to do kind of like a big defense umbrella because you have so many political, economic, social, religious viewpoints. The only way you can live together in peace is by allowing people to live the way that they want to live in their own area. Well, of course, as long as they don't harm anybody. I did an episode covering Cato's papers as well. I will link to that in the show notes. His paper number three, tenthamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Again, now no one really disagreed that, uh, again, publicly, that uh, the dangers of consolidation were bad. The debate was really about whether or not the Constitution was going to create a consolidated government. And the focus of that started with the what they called the celebrated Montesquieu, the writer of The Spirit of the Laws from 1748. And here's how he put it. There would be an end of everything where the same man, single person, or same body, group of people, whether of the nobles or of the people, to exercise those three powers, uh, legislative, executive, and judicial, he's getting to, to exercise those three powers, that of enacting laws, that of executing the public resolutions, and that of trying the causes of individuals. So any public body that can have all three powers in one hand, that would be an end of everything, of all liberty. James Madison cites this same type of a thing in Federalist number 47, he said the accumulation of all power, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of a tyranny. So James Madison agreed with Montesquieu that consolidating all the power into the same group of people, legislative, executive, and judicial, is the definition of a tyranny. But Madison did not think that this actually, the proposed government he was so uh, influential in helping create, qualified as that definition. Anyways, here's how Montesquieu described it. Back to the spirit of the laws. He said, when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty. Again, he said, there is no liberty if the judiciary power be not separated from the legislative and executive. Were it joined with the legislative, the life and liberty of the subject would be exposed to arbitrary control. Arbitrary power is power, well, basically what we have today. Government based on the whim of people with power and the ability to exercise that power. Arbitrary power was one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence. It's what the founding generation, the old revolutionaries, fought a long, bloody war to get away from. And, well, unfortunately, we're right back to it. Anyways... 
back to Montesquieu, for the judge would then be the legislator, where it joined to the executive power, the judge might behave with violence and oppression. Now, Madison clarified this kind, his view uh, or his opinion on Montesquieu in Federalist Number 47. He basically says, yes, in the Constitution, he does concede we do have a partial mixture of these powers. It's partially federal and it's partially, some people say partially federal, partially national. He also said partially consolidated, but it's not a complete consolidation is what he's saying. And he talks about uh, this exact set of quotes from Montesquieu, again, in Federalist 47, which will be linked to in the show notes at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. He said he did. Montesquieu did not mean that these departments ought to have no partial agency in or no control over the acts of each other. His meaning were the whole power of one department is exercised by the same hands which possess the whole power of another department. The fundamental principles of a free constitution are then subverted. So he's taking the position that you have to have basically all the powers in the same group of hands. Now, one might actually make the case that the same group of hands would be the federal government then in and of itself, and then it is a consolidated government because that same group of people, even if it's separated in different branches because they're part of the same organization, they would take the alternative position. Here is Patrick Henry, for example, in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, June 4th. I'm not going to list all the dates here. Just I just kind of tend to do that as I go through this. It kind of helps me along a little bit as well. But Patrick Henry put it this way, that this is a consolidated government is demonstrably clear. He read the same words that Madison read, and he's going on that what Montesquieu warned about was what they were putting together. Madison is saying, well, what Montesquieu warned about, you're having a semantic issue here. But anyways, Patrick Henry goes on. He says, the danger of such a government is, to my mind, very, the danger of such a government is, to my mind, very striking. He asks why, and he explains his view on this. My political curiosity, exclusive of my anxious solicitude for the public welfare, leads me to ask, who authorized to speak? them to speak the language of we the people instead of we the states. States, he said, are the characteristics and the soul of a confederation. If the states are not the agents of this compact, it must be one great consolidated national government of the people of all the states. And one might be thinking about the 17th Amendment, which I'm going to get to in a little bit here as well. Now, M.J.C. Vile, and I've got a link to this over at Liberty Fund, at least an excerpt of his chapter four of constitutionalism and separation of powers. He pointed out that, well, Montesquieu wasn't super clear on a lot of this stuff, and it could be read to defend all kinds of different viewpoints. And that's what we see playing out here on both sides of this consolidation debate, at least over ratification of the Constitution. He said Montesquieu's approach did lead to a good deal of confused speculation about his own loyalties. Was he advocating monarchy as the best system of government, or did he believe in a mixed system, or was he a good Republican? Evidence for all these points, and maybe we can do a deep dive into more of his work over time if you're super interested. Otherwise, just read it. There's free links to it. I'm going to link to the entire text in the show notes. Evidence for all these points of view can be found in his great work. And by the end of the 18th century, of course, just after ratification, but by around that time, Montesquieu was being quoted as an authority in English, England, France, and America as conclusive evidence of the rightness of very different systems of government. So everybody had their version and could find something that they liked in what Montesquieu was having to say. So there was, you could see on both sides. Now, here, for example, James Wilson, who was a very strong Federalist, one of the biggest big government guys of the time, a great legal mind. He ended up on the Supreme Court as well. He was very much in support of a principle of delegated and reserved powers. He made the clearest explanation of that structure of the Constitution, what ended up becoming the Tenth Amendment, to hammer that home as well. But here he is in a couple of speeches in December of 1787 in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention. He asks, or he says, we have heard much about a consolidated government. Of course, 
This was the huge warning from the Anti-Federalists. This is consolidated or it's going to lead to a consolidated situation. He says, I wish the honorable gentleman would condescend to give us a definition of what does he mean by this. And Wilson's seeing this as well, the possible confusion. I don't know if he's playing off the fact that he knows that you can define things different ways or you can read Montesquieu in different ways. But he says, I think this is more necessary because I apprehend that the term in the numerous times it has been used has not always been used in the same sense. It's always used a little differently. And he go, goes through a few examples of uh, how some people are doing this. He said Mr. Finley, when speaking on this subject, says that he means by a consolidation that government which puts the 13 states into one. That was the description of it. Basically, the states, even if they still existed on the surface, they would have no true authority. It would really be directed by a central power. He said the Honorable... Gentleman from Fayette, Mr. Smiley, that's a great name, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, gives you this definition. Quote, what I mean by a consolidated government is one that will transfer the sovereignty from the state governments to the general government. And then from Cumberland, Mr. Whitehill, instead of giving you a definition, sir, he tells you, this is a consolidated government and we have proved it so. He said, these, I think, are the different description given to us of a consolidated government. Now, not everybody. So Wilson then, through those speeches, especially on December 11, 1787, he then goes and refutes all three of these positions, at least in his view. Now, much of the opposition on the other side wasn't even saying that it was absolutely consolidated today. Some absolutely were. We know that Mr. Whitehill was, Patrick Henry was. But a lot of the opposition was that it tended towards that over time, and they were thinking kind of long game. Well, okay, maybe it's going to be read this way today, but we know that human nature and the uh, maxim that power always expands and grows means that when you give them an opportunity to do bad stuff over time, they absolutely will and they're going to read this in the way to give themselves the most power possible. Richard Henry Lee was one that came from that camp for sure. And here in a letter to Patrick Henry, he said, The most essential danger from the present system arises from its tendency to a consolidated government. This was He was an anti-federalist, but he was also elected as a senator in the first Congress. So here he is in Congress in 1789 writing a letter to Patrick Henry saying... OK, there's a problem here. We see that we have to make it very clear that these powers are limited. He was advocating for a Bill of Rights to help hammer that home. But the most essential danger to Richard Henry Lee was a tendency towards consolidated government. He wasn't saying it was already, but it would lead to that over time. And in Cato, in his third anti-federalist essay a few years earlier here in 1787, basically... He's saying whatever you want to call this, because of the immense territory that it covered, over time things will get consolidated. He said this unkindred legislature, the Congress, therefore composed of interests opposite and dissimilar in their nature, will in its exercise, so in practice he's saying this is how it's going to play out, it will emphatically be like a house divided against itself. I mean, that is a pretty prophetic warning right there. And I think we see that one playing out every single day today. Here uh, from Patrick Henry in the Virginia Ratifying Conventions Convention, he's also taking this position that over time it's going to play out that way as well. He thinks it's always going to be consolidated. He's pretty hardcore on this. He said a number of characters of the greatest eminence in this country object to this go government for its consolidating tendency. A lot of people are warning that that's how it's going to play out. This is not imaginary. It is a formidable reality. That's Patrick Henry. Sentinel in his fifth anti-federalist paper said, the powers proposed to be vested in Congress will necessarily annihilate and absorb the state legislatures and judiciaries and produce from their wreck one consolidated government. We still have state legislatures and state judiciaries, but in many ways the state legislatures are really just tools of the central government, of the so-called general or federal government today. So I definitely agree that that's how it's played out. That was a warning 
from Sentinel number five in December of 1787. And again, he's warning that the general welfare clause in conjunction, this power of taxation would help them do this over time. He said, by the eighth section of the article of the first of the proposed government, article one, section eight, he said, the Congress shall have our, to have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare. And he highlights general welfare of the United States. And then he asks, now what can be a more, more comprehensive power than these words? Every species of taxation, whether external or internal, are included. Whatever taxes, duties, and excises that the Congress may deem necessary, their own view of what they think is necessary and proper for the general welfare may be imposed on the citizens of these states and levied by their officers. And George Mason in the Virginia Ratifying Convention warned that this power, this general welfare clause and the taxation power was the tool that they were going to use to consolidate power and become a centralized despotism. And he said the assumption of this power, this is George Mason, the assumption of this power of laying direct taxes, and this is before they even went way further with the 16th Amendment, this assumption of this power of laying direct taxes does of itself entirely change the confederation of the states into one consolidated government. This power being at discretion, unconfined, and without any kind of control, must carry everything before it. So he thought that this the power of direct taxation, we can see that with tens of thousands of new agents always being, well, they want to keep expanding the power to uh, harass and collect and control the people through the IRS today. This was a pretty prophetic warning from George Mason. Patrick Henry, again, talking about the same thing. He said, this, sir, must naturally terminate in a consolidation. If this will do for other people, it will never do for me. And Sentinel tied all these together, and he said, well, then you, on top of it, even if you don't think that these things will lead to a consolidated, centralized state that is a despotism, so what we have today, the largest government in history, he said, well, what about this whole supremacy clause? And that's how he basically put it. He said, lest the foregoing powers should not be suffice to consolidate the United States into one empire. The convention, as if determined to prevent the possibility of a doubt, as if to prevent all clashing by the opposition of state powers, as if to preclude all struggle for state importance, as if to level all obstacles to the supremacy of universal sway, which in so extensive a territory would be an iron-handed despotism, have ordained by the Article the Sixth. Then he reads through, or he uh, writes out the the supremacy clause. He even talks about pursuant to the Constitution. We talk about that all the time. They there are so many people who think that federal law is supreme in all situations, in all cases whatsoever. Was a rallying cry of the American Revolution that I'm not going to get into right now. But Sentinel warned. He said the words pursuant to the Constitution will be no restriction to the authority of Congress. <laughs> Looks like he nailed that one. You can put it on paper, but unless the people are willing to enforce that, they're going to keep doing whatever the heck they want until they have completely unlimited power. He says for the foregoing section gives them unlimited legislation. Their unbounded power of taxation does alone include all others as whoever has the purse strings will have full dominion. So the words pursuant to the Constitution would not actually end up being a restriction on their power. Now, here's James Madison. Now, unlike Madison or Mason and Henry and Sentinel and Cato and Brutus and some of the others, Madison was less concerned about a consolidating tendency and more with what he called a complete or absolute consolidation. So the Federalists, even those who agreed with the notion that, OK, there are some consolidating tendencies. Well, we, this is what we got to do, basically, is what they're saying. He said the members of the now, but check this out. He's saying it does, he's not concerned about a tendency, but here's what would make it a problem. The members of the National House of Representatives are to be chosen by the people at large in proportion to the numbers of in the representative districts. When we come to the Senate, its members are elected by the states in their equal and political capacity. 
So even if we have a consolidating tendency, he is not concerned about it because you still have a separation between a popular national type government through House of Representatives, for example, and then the equal state capacity, a true federal structure in the Senate at that time. He said, but had the government been completely consolidated, so Madison's concern was against a complete consolidation, the Senate, he said, would have been chosen by the people in their individual capacity in the same manner as the members of the other house. So James Madison said, all these things that you're warning about, about consolidation anti-federalists, are no problem because the senators are chosen by the state legislatures. If we really wanted to have a complete consolidation and thus a real despotism, we would just have the Senate chosen by the people at large, just like what happens in the House. He says this, thus it is a, of, of a complicated nature, and this complication, I trust, will be found to exclude the evils of absolute consolidation as well as as of a mere confederacy. So he thought total consolidation was bad and pure confederacy was also bad. He wanted some kind of middle of the road, but no longer does he have that middle of the road since a pretty bad year early in the 20th century. Now, some people were suggesting that this was kind of the plan all along. We don't won't get all the centralized power that we want today. We know, for example, that James Madison actually did want more centralized power. Alexander Hamilton as well. Madison, for example, wanted the uh, federal government, the, the new national government, to have a veto power over all state laws. And when they, he didn't get that, you know, he was writing to George Washington back and forth saying this is what we should have, for example. But we're not going to get all of that, so we have to be happy with what we've got. And I think he was actually honest about that. Others actually were kind of, we'll just say Hamilton, basically sold the Constitution as being one thing before ratification, I think with a goal of just saying, let's just flip the switch after it's done. Maybe he wasn't alone. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that George Mason warned about in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. This was June 19th. He said there are many gentlemen. Now, he was in Philadelphia, so he knew he was having conversations with everybody. He knew what the people there wanted, even though they were keeping it all secret. And Mason said there are many gentlemen in the United States who think it right that we should have one great national consolidated government and that it was better to bring it about slowly and imperceptibly rather than all at once. So he knew there were people there who wanted a great consolidated empire, but knew that the people wouldn't be on board with it, so you just had to do it step by step by step. Hamilton, for sure. I'm curious who else Mason thought was was doing that. Now, James Madison was so upset by this that he actually interrupted. And, you know, and they did that from time to time. But he interrupted and demanded an explanation because Madison was there as well. Was He was concerned that uh, the, the people would start thinking that that's what everybody at the Philadelphia Convention wanted. And Mason basically, he didn't name any names, but he said, you know, in conversations with Mr. Madison, he didn't say him by name, but in conversations with the honorable member, Blah, blah, blah. I know he was absolutely opposed to this approach and Madison, but there are others that we all know certainly wanted to do this. And Madison said he was fine with that response. So that tells me that Madison understood this as well. So I think at the end of the day, Patrick Henry warned us and warned us many times and so did many others. He said consolidation must end in the destruction of of our liberties. It must end. It's not going to just maybe, but it absolutely will. And living under, again, the largest government in history, where they take so much money from us and throw it all around the world, they're destroying the, the purchasing power of our of our dollar. They uh, say that we don't have a right to self-defense. What we grow in our backyard is up to their control. The size of our toilets kind of light bulbs. You can go on and on and on about how many parts of the daily lives of the people are controlled by centralized power, which is totally antithetical to the principles of the revolution and, of course, to the principles of the Articles of Confederation and even the Constitution as well. And this is the kind of essential foundational information we work hard every single day to get out to more and more people. 
consolidation must end in the destruction of our liberties. So even if you like the short-term results, centralized power is the problem. It's not the solution. Nothing helps us get this kind of information out to more and more people every single day, more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us for as little as 2 bucks a month. We also have annual and lifetime options over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Clay Kent makes a really good point here. I'm just going to take a look over in the live chat and see if there's a couple of comments or questions I can get back to. He said, how do you boil a frog? Little by little, starting with cold water. And same thing with advancing liberty. I often cite Thomas Jefferson in his letter to his friend, the Reverend Charles Clay, where he said, the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. We must be content, contented to secure what we can get from time to time and always press forward for what is yet to get. I'm just paraphrasing off the top of my head. But basically, he was saying it takes time to convince people even what is for their own good. But on the other side of the spectrum, just like Clay Kent said over on Facebook in the chat here, how do you boil a frog? So those who actually wanted to expand power and knew that they couldn't get everything in the proposed general government right off the bat, they backed off a little bit. Some of them, I think Madison is one of them, this is my personal opinion, just was like, okay, I wanted it to be different. I didn't get it that way. Let's enforce it the way it's supposed to be. Others, like Hamilton, were just flip-floppers and happy to lie no matter what. So that I think that was a really important one. M. Gabriels is a great one. We'll share. Thank you. Of course, Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Smashing the like button, sharing, leaving comments, especially in the archive, reviews on Apple Podcasts, all that stuff triggers the algorithm of the mainstream platforms and tells them to show us to more people. We're reaching and teaching a lot more people than I ever, ever imagined. Larry Clark says, so have we been duped all along? I don't know. And that might actually be a topic for another discussion. I think some of them actually were duping us. But then on the other hand, you have people like Benjamin Franklin, who was also a very hardcore federalist as well. But he specifically said, like, look, ultimately gets down to what the people are going to allow. And he said, just like every other government, this one will end in despotism because that's what the people are going to beg for when they become so corrupt they can have nothing else. So that's what alt reality is get getting at here as well in the chat. Very few know and love liberty and are willing to defend it these days. And I'm not sure if you're doing it on purpose or not. That's basically citing a great quote from Samuel Adams, writing in the uh, newspaper of the Sons of Liberty, the Boston Gazette, October of 1771. He said, all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. I think I'll wrap with that. I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational, more important than anything. I hope you learned something. Of course, continue leaving comments. Uh, smashing likes, reviews, all that stuff. And don't forget our membership program over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.